I have an aim. My aim is the same in every single talk. David knows this, right? I want you to know less at the end than you think you know now, OK? And I'm well on my way. I always succeed, no matter how well I do. Why? Because actually, science is about questions. It's not about answers. And anything interesting begins with doubt, right? Someone said, all revolutions begin with a joke. Because what you're basically saying is, you mean it could be different. Okay? So I actually want you to have doubt at the end of this. And I want you to have doubt on what it is you think you know, believe, and see of the world, but also yourself. That's my aim. The first thing I want to start with is this, which might be an interesting idea for the people here, which is that information is meaningless, literally. There's no inherent value in any piece of information, even at the most fundamental level. Even the light that falls onto your eye is meaningless. Right? Data is pointless in of itself. And the reason is because it could literally mean anything. And again, this is true at the most fundamental level of what the brain is doing. Even seeing lightness, which is the easiest thing that the brain does, is dealing with information that is meaningless. So this creates a fundamental problem. And it's this problem that everyone's brains, and not just the human brain, has evolved to solve, which is how do we deal with the uncertainty the meaninglessness of information. How does the brain construct meaning? Okay? And I'm going to show you examples of how the brain constructs meaning. And for the very first time, I'm also going to try to do an experiment on you all. Okay? Not an invasive one. Okay? The first thing that the brain does is it finds relationships. It finds pattern. Statistical relationships. Statistical correlations. Right? It's because the brain literally can't do absolutes. Absolutes are impossible for the brain. If I were able to freeze your eyes from moving, your eyes are constantly moving. They're called saccades. If I could freeze your eyes from moving, which I actually could do, what would happen? Your eyes are open. Your eyes aren't moving. What do you think would happen? You become blind. The whole world disappears. Your brain needs contrast. Contrast is literally life. It needs difference. It can't deal with absolutes. So the first thing your brain does is it finds relationships. But that's not enough. Relationships by themselves are ambiguous. They don't tell you what to do. So your brain then has to create a meaning of those relationships. It has to find a behavioral significance of what those relationships meant in the past. OK? What, why this is possible is what I call redefining normality. Your brain is constantly redefining normality. It's constantly adapting according to his experiences and creating value in relationships. So I'm going to show you how quickly your brain can see the world in a whole new way. Okay? I want you to notice that those two desert scenes are exactly the same in terms of their spectral content. They, one is just simply the flip being of the other. Yes? Yes. OK. Look at the, if we have, the, well, probably be OK. If we look at the dot between the, the green and the red squares, just look at that dot. Don't look anywhere else. Just stare at that dot. We're going to stare at it for about 30 seconds. And you're going to get very sleepy. <laughs> right? Keep staring at that dot. What's happening while you're staring at it? Your brain is learning. It's getting a new experience. It's interacting with the world. It's coming to literally see it in a new way. It's learning that the left side of its visual field is under green light, and the right side of its visual field is under red. That's becoming its new normal, which means anything you see after that will be guided by that new experience. When I tell you to, not yet, I want you to look at the dot between the desert scenes, but not yet. Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> Do they still look the same? Yes. If you're red, green, colorblind, which 7% of the male population here is, it won't work for you. Right? For those who still can't see it or not colorblind, Come see me after. OK? So that's how quickly your brain could come see the world in a new way. Thank you. But sometimes we need the help of other people to make sense of the world, to find the relationships. Right? 
not just ourselves. And there are different ways by which we help others find relationships and find value in those relationships. Here's one way. Yes? Ooh, the voice. Okay. Here's another way. Right? For those who run companies, you have two different leadership styles there. Okay? So the point is, when you open your eyes, you never see the world as it is. You never see information. You don't even see pattern. What you only ever see is a meaning. And that meaning is grounded in your history. Seeing red is literally seeing a meaning. Okay? So I want to play a game to show you how this is true in something that we're quite familiar with, right? which is language. Now, as a game, I want you to read what you see. OK? We're going to count you in. Ready? One, two, three. Very good. One, two, three. Wow, it's like school. OK, one, two, three. Any Portuguese in the room? <laughs> right? Someone? Oh, brilliant. OK. One, two, three. So remember what the instructions were. Read what you see. That literally says, what are you reading? What are you reading? There are no words there. They're only letters. And yet you put an H between that W and A. Why? Because it would have been useful to do so in the past. You're seeing the meaning of the information. Right? Your brain has literally encoded the statistics of co-occurring letters in the English and Portuguese language. Right? So you're literally seeing a meaning. None of you read what you're dreaming. Why? Because I had you reading. So I primed you to read it in a certain way. Very gullible. OK? <laughs> this is true even for our most basic perceptions. All right? So Martin, if I could have my, my lights. OK, let's see if this works. So right, we have these. Can you see gonna, there's going to be a shadow here, two shadows. It's this one I'm interested in. Can everyone see that shadow? Everyone over there, blocked by there. Sorry, you can't be able to see it. Oh, well, no, you can't see it. OK. Right? See that shadow there? What color is it? Green. It's green. What color is it really? Green. That's actually a gray shadow. There is a blue light, a purplish light, and a white light. That part of the screen is the only part of the screen where the white light is hitting it and yet you see it as green because your brain has encoded the relationships between the colors and is seeing a meaning. In this case, it happens to be green. OK? Thanks, Martin. So even at the most simple level, your brain is seeing meaning grounded in relationships, which means your assumptions determine what it is that not only what you see, but also what you discover in information. And here we're going to try an experiment. Haven't done this before. Right? I want you to all get your phones out. How much time do I have? Right? And you're all going to send me text messages. Now, if I had time, I'm sure I would have come up with a much better technical solution to this. But you're literally going to send me a text message. So I want you to get your phone out, and you're going to type in my number. I don't know how dangerous this is. Right? <laughs> Everyone ready? OK, 07, 515, OK? Good. Now, I'm going to show you a string of letters. And in that text message, you're going to write your first three words that you can see. OK? And those words are all three-letter words. All right? So find the first three-letter words that you see, three three-letter words, and put them into your text. OK? Should be pretty quick. You have it? OK, tell me some three-letter words. Bit. Sorry? Bit. Bit. Dot. Dot. And. 
Okay, brilliant. For those who are a bit slower, now you have some clues. Okay, now you've got your three letters. Don't send three words. Don't send the text yet. I want you to do the same thing again, but with this next string of letters. Go. Okay, what do you see? Tell me some three letter words. Run. Run. Dog. What? Yeah. Dog, sorry? Bought. Bought. Okay, it's amazing how many people don't say sex. And yet everybody sees it, or maybe it's just me. Okay. <laughs> All right, now send me that text. So, what's going on here? Those two letter strings are actually the same. They're made up the exact same letters, just in different patterns. What's the assumption that your brain is using? That co-occurring letters belong to each other because of your assumptions about language. So you're more likely to put letters together that are near each other. Okay? But you wouldn't have known that that was the assumption your brain was using in figuring out what those words are. Okay? What's more is that your brain is actually using these assumptions to determine its discoveries of the world as well as its creations of the world. Sometimes creations that don't even exist, can't even exist. I'm going to play you a piece of sound, and I want you to see if you can hear anything in it. Okay? Hear anything? Just random sound, right? Now, I'm going to give you some structure. That structure is grounded in your experience of language. But it's going to be a visual structure. And then I want you to see if you can hear something new. Make a discovery in that sound. OK? Did you hear anything? Yeah said something about this audience. OK, so that's visual information and suddenly giving you a structure that's consistent with your assumptions. And you're applying that structure to new information for which there is no structure, making a discovery that doesn't actually exist. OK, anyone know what that song is? Very good. Right, that's what the song is. Right? What's really quite fundamental is our assumptions determine what we see. They determine our discoveries. They're even the basis of what we, what we create. And yet, we're almost completely blind to our assumptions, especially the assumptions that we inherit. Right? They're the most difficult assumptions to actually reveal. And I'll tell you why knowing your assumptions is so important. Now, some of you, maybe all of you, are saying, that's fine. But I'm actually quite an independent, free will kind of a person. I have choice. OK? Well, let's find out. Here are two shapes that you've never seen. Yes? Agreed? There's no name for these shapes. They're not circles or squares. Right? You haven't seen them before. Now I'm going to give you two words that you've also never seen. The first one is kiki. OK? Second one is boo-boo. Now, you independent, free-thinking people, you can kind of see where I'm going. Which of these shapes is Kiki, and which of these shapes is Boo Boo? Remember, they don't have names. You've never seen them before. So which one's Kiki, which one's Boo Boo? How many people think that is the right orientation? How many people don't want to admit that that's the right orientation? Oh, I want to be different, OK? What we actually don't know, that was an experiment done in the 1920s. I want to show you some data. And we're actually going to do another experiment, never been done. And another observation that's predicated on something we just discovered last week, OK? Why is this happening? No one knows. Our hypothesis is it has everything to do with pain and pressure. Your brain has an overrepresentation of sharpness. Why? Because that's behaviorally valuable. So if you look at this image, you'll see that probably, if you think about what's similar to what, the top line, middle line, and the bottom line are similar to each other. You'd probably organize it in that way. Agreed? 
Mathematically, it's exactly the opposite. Why are you grouping it this way? Because your brain is grouping it according to sharpness and roundedness. Even though mathematically, the orientation is the other way. That's how strongly this is, how important this is for us. That suggests that actually, if I take a painful concept, which activates the same parts of your brain as actual physical pain, we should be able to get the same effect. So if I give you two words, love and hate, which one of these shapes is love, and which one of these shapes is hate? All right? Now, how many would say this is the right configuration? Of course, there's no right. How many people say the other? One. Interesting. OK. <laughs> two. You two should meet. OK. <laughs> right? What if? I give you the word odio. Now, when giving the word odio, the current hypothesis is it has to do with the shape of your mouth. When I, make, when I say boo-boo, I'm making a rounded shape, hence the rounded uh, shape of the mouth, hence the rounded shape visually. What if I give you the word odio? How many people think odio is the sharp shape or the rounded shape? How many people think it's this way? Yes? Most people. How many people think it's that way? Right. Now, in Chile, when I did this just a couple weeks ago to a thousand teachers, they all said it was this way. Why? Because odio means hate. So even though it's a rounded sound, they associate it with a sharp shape because of what it means. Okay? So your assumptions define what you perceive. Right? What about your perceptions of yourself? Does that determine what you actually see in the world? Again, another study we've just done, got the data last week, is I can put you in different states of power. So how you perceive yourself, how powerful you perceive yourself. What is power? The ability to be in control. How much control do I feel is directly related to power. And this is not just humans, it's any animal. Okay? And I can put you in two different states of power in just a few minutes. And as a consequence, you will start seeing the world very differently. And in the experiment we did, we put people in different states of power and we presented them with a color illusion experiment. So you notice you have four gray tiles on the left and seven gray tiles on the right. Yes? Those are all physically gray tiles. If I change their context, which changes their meaning, the color of those tiles will change. I want you to keep your eye on this one. Okay. The one on the left front. Okay. See what happens to its percep your perception of it. What color is it now? It's blue. It's literally gray. The four blue tiles on the left are all gray. The seven yellow tiles on the right are also gray. If I were to take them out of the screen and show them to you like this, they'd be gray. They're physically the same, and yet you see them as being different. Why? Because in your past experience, it would have been useful to do so. Now, if I put you in different states of power, you actually see this illusion differently. People in a less state of power, feeling powerless, they see the illusion stronger. People in a more state of stronger state of power see the illusion weaker. Why? Because if you're in a lower state of power, context becomes far more important. People in lower state of power use context. Okay. That actually alters the way you actually look at the world. What's more is people in a higher state of power are more likely to take risks. Their behavior is more likely to be action-driven. You're more likely to have opinions that differ from the norm and to be comfortable with that. You actually prefer images that are more abstract than figurative. People in a lower state of power are better able to detect change. Imagine a mouse versus a predator, right? Constantly checking, detecting change. People in lower state of power tend to see pattern that doesn't even exist. If I show you a random noise, a person in low power state of power will actually see pattern there. Okay? So even your perception of yourself determines what you see in the world. So who cares? Just finishing off here. I'll give you, just to conclude with, the brain evolved to continually redefine normality because information is inherently meaningless. Okay? Which means we're actually defined by our history. 
And what's more is that history is determined by what you look at. Even your perception of self alters what you look at, which then feeds back to determine what your history is. Your history then determines what you look at. Okay? And I want to show you how basic what you look at can change what you see. So here we have an X going back and forth. You'll see the X probably going from left to right, yes? If I ask you to look in a different place, here, at some point the two bars will dissociate and they'll go against each other. There'll be separate bars going up and down. Can you get that? Yes? Push your hand up if you can get that so I can see. Now if you look at the intersection, you'll see an X. If you look at the boundary, you see two bars. Depending on what you look at, you're actually seeing mutually exclusive possibilities. Okay? Which means that actually, we create the history that creates us. Okay? And in another sense, we're actually creating our own meaning. So our perception of ourself is fundamental not only to how we see the world, but how we see ourselves and how we will see ourselves in the future. Okay? So I think I'm out of time, yes? Thank you very much. <laughs>